From Boston University and BU Alumni Relations, welcome to Proud to Be You Around the World. I'm your host, Jeff Murphy, and this season we're taking the podcast on the road to meet some of our most interesting and accomplished alumni navigating life and careers in cities across the globe. My guest today is screenwriter and filmmaker Rel Dowdell. Rel earned his master's in film production from the College of Communication in 1996. During his time at BU, Rel made a name for himself with a groundbreaking thesis project that would go on to become the critically acclaimed and award-winning film Train Ride. His most recent work, Where's Daddy?, is a feature-length documentary examining the impact of the child support system on African-American families. Stay tuned to hear an exclusive clip from the documentary at the very end of this episode. Rel is one of over 4,000 Terriers in Philadelphia, and he shares both the challenges and opportunities that go along with building a career in film in the city of brotherly love. Rel, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on the Proud to Be You podcast. Are you, you're living in Philly? Are you born and raised Philadelphia? Yeah. Or? Okay, yeah. perfect. And did you grow up uh, with artists in the family that got you into film, or, or how did that all happen for you? Interesting question. My mother had a lot of artistic acumen i would say she was really someone that always i saw is singing and painting and drawing and um but my dad um, he he's he's an avid reader i guess i guess it comes from in some ways both places but um uh, my mother probably was the main one who I who I saw a lot of visually doing a lot of things that were artistic around the house. If that makes sense. Sure. So when was it that you fell in love with film, and, and was there like one movie that like just changed everything for you? Wow, that's a good question, right there. You know, my mother took me to a lot of movies when I was when I was young. A lot of them, like I mean, whatever was out, we saw it, and it was like it wasn't like a specific palette of movies. We saw everything from I remember seeing. Tootsie to, uh, gosh, David Cronenberg movies. Mm -hmm. And um, it didn't, like, whatever was out, Raised the Lost Ark. I mean, I was a kid. Rocky, it was like, you know, when you're young and you, you're in this theater and you see this big screen with these powerful visuals and these, and these uh, driving stories, it has an impact on you for sure. That's why I say, you know, I think nowadays a lot of times a lot of young people are probably getting cheated out of the experience because a lot of stuff is streaming. It's not the same effect like it. When you're in a movie theater when you're eight, nine years old and you see this, this the curtains pull back and 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 you see you know Harrison Ford pull out a whip and 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 uh and these great sound effects and uh you know Close Encounters of the Third Kind or ET or all those movies Jaws I mean it really does have an impact on you so I think that's where this this driving force of wanting to 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 contribute came from. It's interesting. One it's, film that yeah. I saw that was very artistic that I could say had an effect on me as far as looking at how I was marveled at how the film was made was a 1976 film called uh, Bugsy Malone. That was pretty interesting because Alan Parker used these young kids like in adult roles. They were like playing like a gangsters and it was a musical. So I was like, wow, you know, you have, I think Scott Bale was in it, Jodie Foster was in it and um, it's pretty fascinating to see young people play adult roles. Uh, so I, I, I think I read that you went to Fisk University as an undergrad. Yes. Were you already already had an eye on being a filmmaker? or what No, not until, uh, not until I read an article about um, filmmakers that were going to graduate school for film. Like Spike Lee went to NYU, and I read John Singleton went to USC, and Charles Burnett went to UCLA. And I was like, wow, I didn't know you could actually go and get an education in film. So I applied to you know, all those programs. I got into USC, which is the uh, number one program, in the, mm -hmm. which everyone knows. And I applied to BU as well. I was like, I want to go on the East Coast, well on the West Coast. So I got into both programs, but USC started in the, in the spring, and BU started in the fall. So I didn't want to lose any time. So I went to BU, and, I, and uh, that's why you know, I ended up there. But um, it, it wasn't. There was no film, there was no film, uh, like a lot of film classes at Fisk. Fisk was more of a liberal arts, got a, good, a lot of good writing training. Right, right. But um, it, was, it was reading about this, this kind of this new uh, renaissance wave of black filmmakers. Uh, Julie Dash, Spike Lee, John Singleton, Charles Burnett, 
uh, and I was like, wow, these people are, are going to film schools and they're, 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 they're wreaking havoc. They're making a name for themselves in these programs. And I was like, I want to, I want to go and try to emulate the same somewhere. So when you got to BU, uh, and dove in, was, was it what you thought you wanted it to be? Were, were there any surprises or tell me more about your experience here and, you know, not classes. really surprises. I mean, I'm competitive. So I knew that, you know, film was, I know that film schools are competitive because the students are competitive but at the same time I wanted to build relationships with people like I wanted to develop uh, you know a, a team of people that I could kind of like build with um, and, and make good things with um, that at BU doesn't a lot of students there I think don't really I think a lot of people come there wanting to be directors and everybody can't be a director that's not possible once a lot of people get to film school they realize that their real their strength may not be in directing it may be in editing, it may be in lighting, it may be in set design, it may be in cinematography, it may be in a lot of different fields, but I remember a lot of the students that wanted to be directors, and slowly but surely they realized that their strength was not in directing, so they went into other fields. So was it was it, was it it what I expected it to be? Um, film school was unpredictable, so you can't really, you can't, I don't think any film program you can go in and say, I expect it to be like this, because it's like, Film is an ever-changing palette of education. So um, I just came in not wanting to be, uh, I wanted to be like a sponge and learn as much as possible and, and see what other people were doing and make my own way. So when I was in film school, uh, Quentin Tarantino was the rage. You know, Pulp Fiction was out, and a lot of the students wanted to be like him. And I was like, nah, I want to be my own person. Like, I don't want to, everybody was putting all their student films dressed up. People, the costuming was like Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction. And I was like, that's cool, but it's not original. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to come there and be original. And that's how I was able to succeed because I kind of came in with this, this particular trajectory of being myself and being true to my own vision and true to my own art. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned that your one of your goals was to come in and 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 build a team of people that you could create with. Um, I know from talking with you that you were pretty successful here um, and your, your thesis actually did very, very well. Did, were you able to build that team for that or, or tell me more about how you ended up, like what you produced while you were at BU? What did I, how did that, how did that work out? I knew that, you know, there was BU and then it was Boston. So what I did was like, even though you know BU was the film school, I looked at the whole Boston community as as a way to to uh, get involved with the with the process. So, you know, the Huntington Theater was around at that time, and Esther Roll was there doing a, a play, Raising the Sun, well known actress. So I I I I found a way to meet her. And I found a way to get her involved with my thesis project, which was miraculous because very rarely can you get an established Emmy-winning actress to be in your thesis project. But I, I'm a networking person. I'm a person that I'm not afraid to go and meet people or, or, or get in front of someone. Uh, I had the, the, uh, a, a fantastic cinematographer, Bob Demers, who is actually running our our, uh, our department there in cinematography. He read my script and said, "This is this is fantastic work. I want to be the shooter." So. I was able to develop a team of people there by just by just being on outreach, not traditional um, networking. I was like, it's not my my networking was not just confined to BU. My network was like all over the city. I found like a really good casting director who had done some work in Hollywood. I brought him on board. I had auditions for my roles with actors all over the city came in. Like I remember that we did act when I did auditions. It like it took two days because we had it like advertised in all the publications and I and I it was like I I couldn't get through all the people because the word had gotten out about the quality of the script and Esther Roll was in the film and people were like, Wow, I wanna I wanna audition for this movie so um you have to make Boston work for you. It's not LA. It's not New York. But if you're smart, you'll be able to navigate that area in a way that's beneficial to you. I discovered Russell Hornsby. Russell Hornsby was a was a student there. He was a he was a um acting student there and I we were staying in the same dorm. So he was he heard about the film. I was like, yo man, I want you to audition for the role. As a matter of fact, I just told him I said I, I said I'm gonna give you the role. I didn't even think I don't even think Russell even auditioned. I was so impressed with how he, how he, um, his his demeanor and his, and I saw how the great work he was doing. I was like, Yo, man, you're gonna be the lead in my short film, and he ended up being the lead in the feature film version as well. So 
I was able to really use that Boston community and network with people to really develop a team. But you have to look outside of your your little conclave to be successful. I saw Russell as being someone who Russell had never been in anything before. He had never been in any. I, I looked at Russell. I said, Yo, this is a young guy who's serious about acting, and he's clearly the best in his in his in his uh, in his school. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a break because I can see that. And I saw he was African American, so was I. So I was like, you know what? We need to build. And and uh, and those are the kind of things that uh, while I was there, I was able to get done. And I think that's why I was able to be one of the most successful graduates out of that program. You had some real success with your short uh, and ended up actually uh, winning the Redstone Film Festival that happens every year. How did that feel? The Redstones was small before I won it. Like, I mean, I went to the Redstones before I won it. Like, I used to go. I was like, yo, let me check out this. This is great, you know. And I used to go there, and, and uh, you know, I looked in there. I was like, it was like, you know, it was half full, three-quarters full. But when I was in it, <laughs> I went around to the whole camp. I said, yo, I got, I have a film that's going to be in the Redstone Film Festival. I went around all over campus, and I was like, you know, giving out flyers. Come to the Redstone." wasn't just calm. I was in the cafeteria in the in the in the uh, in the main buildings. I was in my dorm and when the Redstones came that night, it was a mob scene. They couldn't even they couldn't even fit everybody into the Redstones. <laughs> and people were standing against the wall, they were standing outside. And then when, you know, I didn't and, and then when I found out that I was actually going to win the Redstones, the place sounded like a like a thunderstorm, a hurricane had hit. People were jumping up and down and and cuz I was, you know, one the, the first African American to win this award you know what i mean so um everybody worked on that film and everybody was involved with that with that film uh you know it was it was a rejoiceful act but i looked at the redstone as something that we really need to promote better so after the redstones after i was in it it became a much bigger event but i was really the person that took that redstone film festival and made it a a, a real sensation because I told the whole BU campus about the Redstones. Mm. <laughs> I That's... was like, you got to come to the Redstones. My film Train Ride is in the Redstones. Just come and check it out. The movie is great. And uh, Esther Rowe is in the movie. Russell's in the film. And I, I just went around to the School of Fine Arts. I went around to wherever I could. And it was like, people come out. And people came out. And yeah. it, it was it was it was awesome. I always thought it was a BU wide thing. I didn't realize it was really only contained within Com. So that's great to hear. So you finish your your master's degree in film, and you've got this award winning short. Do you immediately leave BU knowing that you want to turn Train Ride from a short into a feature? I had some drive to want to do that. That was definitely something because I, I looked at the the small the short film as a as a component to a larger whole, um, and I knew that you know if the same people that I had in the short film would probably be great in the feature film. So I sat down with, you know, I told Russell about it and, um, I, I told Esther Roll about it. That was a very interesting journey because, um, Will Smith wanted to produce that film. He had heard about the short film. Jazzy Jeff had a copy of my short film and he gave it to Will. And one day I'm at home and Will Smith called me on the phone. He was like, yo, I'm on a set of enemy of the state. And, uh, Jeff just let me see your short film. It's great. Let me fly you out here, and let's talk about making this into a feature film. So at one point, Train Ride was going to be a major Hollywood film, um, but it ended up being made independently because of the process. You know, mm -hmm. the studio process can be very arduous. Yeah. But uh, ended up, I ended up having the resources to make it as an independent film, and, and with that independent film, I was able to control all my own casting choices and have people in there like Wood Harris, who went on to be in The Wire and Remember the Titans and uh, a lot of other films. I discovered him in that film as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, MC, a lot of people. MC Light, one of the, my favorite MC rappers Light, from yeah, my youth. She was, <laughs> that, was, that was interesting because she really put a lot into that role. And um, I remember Gerald Perry saw the film. He, he's, he's, he used to do the communicator at uh, the, uh, the Cinematheque. So Gerald Perry was like, he was like the curator of that at, at BU. He would come and show films every every uh every couple of weeks or something when I was there but he's a well known film critic in the area he writes for the uh the Phoenix and all those things okay. but he showed he showed um Train Ride the feature there and, and he actually put in the Boston Phoenix he said Train Ride was like you know one of the best american films he had seen that year mm -hmm. independent or not and yeah. once people read that you know it it took off mm -hmm. so a lot of times you know you have to really have a a navigation of of what you want to do at while you're at film school. Do you want to be a director? 
Do you want to be a screenwriter? Do you want to be an editor? Do you want to be a a uh, a, a set designer? Fortunately for me, my path never changed. I knew I wanted to direct. I knew that I could direct. I just needed to know how to direct and how to assemble a team of people to help me to 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 formulate my vision. And that's why I was able to be successful because you know, I just I just knew what I wanted to do and I wasn't going to let anything impede me from doing so. In 2012 you released a feature called Changing the Game and you've uh, you know been working for a long time, but I can't you brought this up a little bit and this is something I really wanted to dig in with you about is as a film student and then a young filmmaker, how how did you navigate the balance between making art and the business side. It's difficult because raising money is, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's really tough. So you have to kind of be resourceful. Change the Game took a long time to raise money for because I had like several people trying to raise the money for that movie over a long period of time. Train Ride had uh, one main investor. Yeah, I wanted to one, talk about that. Was it was that George Lilly? Yeah, George is an interesting, interesting story because when I was in graduate school, they showed Train Ride, a short film out in L.A. at a showcase. George Lilly had seen the film. And he reached out through alumni to to talk to me, and he said, "I want to meet the young man that made this film." I just I was like, "Wow, you know, this, this esteemed alum wants to talk to me." So we had a great conversation, and he was like, "You know, I want to help you out. I want to I want to give you a, a sizable contribution to help you start off uh, what you're doing." So he gave me the gift through you know alum, and I, I used that to help me get a lot of the seed work done for Train Ride, a lot of the production management team. And uh, he and I have always stayed in touch through every project, and and he helped me a great deal um, with my you know my most recent film, Where's Daddy? Yeah. But the other the other but to raise money for feature films, you know, it takes a it's not it's a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it takes a lot of it. You know, usually you're not going to find one person to give you three hundred thousand dollars or half a million dollars or a million dollars. It takes a team of people usually to raise that kind of money and. Um, that's why the process is so long because you're not raising small money. You're raising a lot of money uh, that has to be, you know, bonded, completion bonded, to, to let the investors know that you're going to actually finish your, your projects. Right. So I'm curious, you, you mentioned Where's Daddy, and I definitely want to make sure that we talk about that because you changed from features and, and your most recent project is a documentary. Did did the business side of things have anything to do with that, or was that purely an artistic decision? That was purely artistic. I just I just was like, you know, I had no aspirations of making a documentary. I just knew, it would be, I know documentaries are very challenging because you're not dealing with a scripted format. You're you're not paying actors. You're 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 really subject to. Um, an unscripted type of palette where you have to really roll with the punches. Some things you can plan where you want your shoot to take place, certain camera moves, certain things, but as far as what is the subject going to say and how is the subject going to react to what you're saying is totally unscripted. So, you know, I think making a documentary really is something that every filmmaker should try to embark on, but that was purely artistic due to the sense that I wanted to show a different side of the African-American lifestyle where there previously been a lot of stereotypes that were believed about it. So, and, and Where's Daddy is about the child support system and sort of in ingratiated discrimination against uh, African-American fathers in particular. What do you, what do you, what caused you to, to want to tell that story and what do you hope is happening because of the movie that you made that's interesting because um you know when you make a documentary you don't know how it's going to be received especially when you're dealing with something that's sensitive because every everybody no matter from the the wealthiest to the most destitute uh has an opinion about their father is your father around was he around is he not around if he's not around do you know why he's not around are you close are you not close were you close at one point and not close anymore did child support have an, an effect on your family is your family separated divorced etc so you know I wanted to take all of those those though that umbrella of those subjects and put them into a documentary and show how they affect the African American family as a whole because a lot of people believe that they believe that black fathers are deadbeats because of the foolishness they see on the Mari Povich show or these the Jerry Springer show or all these uh, the myriad of shows that really just debase the African American father not knowing that they really are a a slew uh, and that's a, a, a word that's mildly 
uh, expressed. There's just a slew of African American men that really are very responsible fathers and loving fathers, but they may have hindrances in taking care of their children. It can be financial. They lost their job. They're not working, but yet they have the system. The child support system has put this this uh, target on them and put them in jail, and that 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 makes the wedge between them and their children much bigger. And you know, the the film asked the question: If a father misses a child support payment, is it worth putting him in jail? Is it worth incarcerating him um, in order to 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 make him pay it? make a payment and in the end does that really support the child because it's called child support so does removing the father out of the equation altogether for whatever time period he's in jail for child support or whatever does that help the child if the, if the father really was active and i think that film uh answers those questions or at least addresses those questions very very well i am uh, so excited to see you've got a hundred percent critics rating on Rotten Tomatoes, are you able to take a step back and, and look at the work that you've done and just feel, wow, you know, I've, I've told this incredibly important story. Uh, critics are responding. Audiences are responding. How does how does that feel? It's interesting because I didn't know that would, you know, you never, you know, I, only, I didn't expect that type of response because, you, you know, it's a very sensitive subject. But one thing I did want to do is uh, I wanted to be the, the emissary of the story. Like, you know, in the film, I'm the person that's kind of driving the narrative along. I'm the person that's the emissary talking to these people, and I think by me being the the uh, the conduit uh, and, and talking to these people and not demonizing each character or each subject, I think that's why the film, you know, turned out well. So um, a lot of law schools now use that film mm-hmm. for their curriculum. Syracuse uses it. University of Kentucky Law School uses it. Princeton Library has it in their library. University of Michigan has it in this library. I'm showing the film tonight at Haverford College mm-hmm. to discuss it with them, and that's a, that's a very elite school here on the main line of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Um, so you never know like how something's going to be responded. But the good thing that I really like about it is that the subject of the film, even though it deals with African American characters, it's universal. It, it, these are these are you know Haverford and, and Boston University and 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 uh, these are not you know these are not just schools that that cater to one demographic of people. These are elite institutions that cover everyone. I think that this issue of the child support system was one that was it's just it was passed through to be discussed. I'm just glad to be the one to bring it out there. I know you had a theatrical release, but where can people see where they can that see? Yeah, now? good question. I would recommend that film. Um, the easiest way to see it, I would probably say, would be on Amazon Prime. Okay. Um, YouTube, YouTube definitely has it. Um, another good way to show it would probably be, or to see that film, um, is on Vudu. You heard that one? Yeah, yeah, V-U-D-U? yeah sure. Vudu. Vudu. Yep. I would say it would be really cool if someone was able to facilitate this into a miniseries. Yeah. That would be really cool yeah, because yeah. if I could do that. I could like talk to Hispanic men. I could talk to different types right. of men and children, and then because the the issue doesn't just sure. it's not just restricted to one area of people. See what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. But someone has to have the vision to be like, yeah, well, let's get it done. You know, that's why I say like the most important thing about any film school that I realize now is the networking that comes out of it. Mm-hmm. You have to have a network of people. You have to be able to go to someone like when they do well and say, yo. uh, the chairman or whoever, whoever's running the place who say, this student is doing well. We got a graduate here who works at Netflix. We have a graduate here that works at Hulu. We have a graduate that works at Universal, or we have an agent that works at CAA or William Morris. Let me get you a meeting with them, get you hooked up, and, and get your vision on the way. Because that's what separates film schools from other ones. Being able to get someone on the phone that's an esteemed graduate and say, help this graduate out. He has vision or she has vision. Once you see this person's short works, you're going to see that this person is worth, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think Because someone could be like, yo, man. Yeah, I mean, we, we need more alumni like you to help create that culture of, yeah. of connection and, and, and help and make things happen. Absolutely, I agree with you. This season on the podcast, we're, we're sort of jumping around from alumni city to alumni city. And with you in Philadelphia, yeah. that's like our sixth largest alumni uh, market. We've got nearly 7,000 BU alumni who live there. But it's it's certainly not. I don't I, I don't know Philadelphia as a filmmaking town. No. All, all of your I believe all of your your movies have been set or sort of 
featured Philadelphia. Is it, do you feel like you're in the right city to be a filmmaker? Interesting Are you closer question. To New York, that it, it works you know, out. That's a good question. Um, surprisingly enough, you know, Philadelphia has a very rich filmmaking tradition. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really seem like it, but um, a lot of the films that um, you know that people see and and uh, uh, and and love are made in you know I mean Rocky was made here Creed was made here Trade in Places was made here The Sixth Sense was made here The Age of Innocence the one with Tom Hanks and and uh, Denzel Philadelphia was with Twelve Monkeys National Treasure I remember that was mm-hmm. shot here the one with Mark Wahlberg trying out for the Eagles was here Invincible oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. so like a lot and recently um, a film with Chadwick Boseman was was shot here even though so philadelphia was the backdrop for new york in that movie mm-hmm. um what's the other one that was won the oscar here mickey Rourke, uh the wrestler yeah the wrestler was shot here mm. so philadelphia has a lot of you know a lot of a lot of stuff that's shot happening. here and i just don't know you see one called silver Linings playbook that was good yeah yeah, yeah. that's philly 100 yeah, percent. yeah yeah, yeah. Well, Rel, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. It was really interesting to chat with you, and, and certainly we want anybody to know if, if they want to turn – well, first of all, everybody should go see Where's Daddy. Please. Uh, and if there's somebody out there that wants to turn it into a miniseries, I know I would I would love to see that. Uh, and so yeah, that would, let us know. That would be awesome. Yeah. Rel, thanks again. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks again to Rel for joining us on Proud to Be You. As you heard, you can see his latest work, Where's Daddy, on Amazon, Google Play, or Vudu. Take a look at the show notes of this episode for all the links. Plus, you'll hear an exclusive clip from the documentary at the end of this episode's credits. The clip you'll hear comes to us courtesy of Rel and Breaking Glass Pictures. On behalf of everyone on the BU Alumni Relations team, thanks so much for listening to Proud to Be You. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you find your episodes. I'm Jeff Murphy, and no matter where your path takes you, be proud to be you. The Proud to Be You podcast is produced by Boston University Alumni Relations. Our theme is from Jump and APM Music. To learn more about Proud to Be You, visit bu.edu slash alumni slash podcast. We start talking about mass incarceration, mm-hmm. child support, and the, the arrests that come with it, like people getting locked up for getting behind on child support. It's a contempt of court. And what you have are people like myself who've never been locked up before who've never been in the system, no misdemeanor, no felony, but all of a sudden you find yourself in prison. You know what I mean? Like you've done all the right things all your life to like not be a statistic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking for myself, you know, I've run a mentor program. I've I've coached track for 11 years, Mm -hmm. coached national champions, and kind of like, you know, set the standard Mm -hmm. for so many young men in Philadelphia in regards Mm -hmm. to like academics and athletics and really stress the importance of, you know, being a a productive member of society Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I looked up and I'm sitting in prison for, you know, being behind on child support. Is that because, like, where did the relationship go wrong? You have a daughter. Yes. Right? And how old is she now? I have a 14-year-old daughter. So when did all this take place? I'll I'll say this. I think that the system, the child support system, Mm -hmm. it it revels in dysfunction. It revels in dysfunction, and it is profiting off the dysfunction of families.